Luke chapter 17 and verse 20 and 21. Um, We're continuing our study on the doctrine of the kingdom, which we haven't talked about since May. And that's over three months ago, isn't it? So we are in, uh, in this book that I wrote, which just leads you through the scripture. Uh, we're in chapter 16, and we're looking uh, tonight and probably next week at pages 215 to 226. And if you never got a copy of this book, um, we, we give them out free to people that are class participants or attendees, so... See me afterwards if you never got one, and I'll give you a copy of your book. I mean, my book, but then it'll be your book because you'll be the owner, right? I'll even sign it if you don't think it'll deflate the value of it too much. You might want to sell it on eBay or something, so you may not want my signature on it. All right, well, Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. Um, As I mentioned before, we're in chapter 16 of my book, The Coming Kingdom, and um, I'm not going to, sometimes my reviews are longer than the actual lectures for that evening, so I'm going to try not to do that, just to kind of remind you a little bit of where we've been. The first major section is, what does the Bible say about the kingdom? And that's the Genesis to Revelation study that we've done in here. And we've developed the kingdom from the Old Testament. We've seen that it's basically a geopolitical reality over the earth with Jesus ruling and reigning the earth from which city? City of Jerusalem. And that's everything that the Old Testament promised concerning the kingdom, as we've carefully documented. And that's the kingdom that was offered to Israel in the first century on a silver platter. Had they received the offer, the kingdom could have come. Tragically, we know that they turned the offer down, and so the kingdom was what? Not canceled, but what? Postponed. Good, good. And it's awaiting a future generation of Israel to receive the offer again. In the meantime, God is at work through which uh, institution? The church, which would be us. And as I've tried to explain, uh, the church is not to be confused with the kingdom. Although many people today are trying to merge the church with the kingdom. And we're trying to say that's not a right way of understanding the Bible. And then from there, we just took a quick look at the main problems with Kingdom Now interpretations. Uh, Probably the dominant view of the church going back to the 4th century and Augustine onward through his book, The City of God, is that the church is the kingdom. And they take all of the kingdom promises and sort of repackage them non-literally and make it sound like they're being fulfilled today. And the biggest problem with that is you just changed everything the Old Testament presented. Uh, With the postponement model, which is what I've been trying to teach, you don't have to change anything. What was promised has been postponed. But with the Kingdom Now model, uh, what you have to do is you have to repackage everything. So since God can't lie and can't contradict himself, I've tried to explain that that kingdom now teaching is something that really doesn't work. Then from there we moved into part three. Why is it that so many people believe that we're in the kingdom now? I mean, there must be verses that they use. So in this portion of it, we're looking at passages that people use to promote the idea that we're living in the kingdom. So one of my teaching methods is not just to lay out what I think the Bible says. It's to lay out what other people believe the Bible says and how to deflate their use of the Bible. 
So anybody can kind of get up in front of you and give you their view of things. And we're trying to go a step deeper in this. For those of you that were with us for our soteriology series, when I got to eternal security, I tried to do that also. Not just lay out the case for eternal security, but what are the passages that people use to deny eternal security and how could those be answered? So I'm basically trying to do the same thing with kingdom now theology. So this portion of it, we'll look at passages from Christ's ministries, ministry, from the book of Acts, from Paul, from the general letters, from Revelation, and then some miscellaneous arguments that people use. And back in May, we were just starting to look at verses from the ministry of Jesus that people use to say that we're in the kingdom now. So we looked at the following statements in Christ's ministry. The kingdom is at hand. Theirs is the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Seek first the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom is suffering violence until now. Uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, Jesus says in his earthly ministry. The kingdom has come upon you. Now, do any of those sound familiar? I know it's been about three months, but we worked through all of those, and I sort of gave you the answer to each of those. In other words, how would a person that believes in a postponed kingdom answer those passages? So from there, we move into Luke 17. That's why I had you open there in your Bibles. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. And this is probably, of all of the verses, not only in Christ's ministry, uh, but really in the whole New Testament. This is the main verse people go to. Anybody that argues that we're in the kingdom will instinctively go to Luke 17, 20, and 21. In fact, when you're talking about this subject, even with people that don't know much about this, they'll say, well, wait a minute, doesn't Luke 17, they may not know the address, but they'll say, doesn't Luke 17, verses 20 and 21 says, the kingdom is in our midst, or the kingdom is in our hearts. In fact, has anybody ever heard somebody use those verses to support a kingdom now idea okay I see a few hands so what do those verses say let's look at them Luke 17 verses 20 and 21 it says now having been questioned by the Pharisees now that's a big deal right there uh, if you're an underliner in your Bible you should underline the word Pharisees now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming he answered and said to them, the kingdom is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom is in your midst. And one of the things that's happened is people are, for whatever reason, are attaching less significance to the things that Paul says. And they're trying to move the discussion from Paul into the middle of the Bible and trying to make it sound as if the things that Jesus said were the most important. Now, uh, we're kind of prone to that argument because Jesus was the Son of God. And, um, you know, Paul was just a, a mere human instrument. But the way to understand the Bible correctly is to understand that many of the things that Jesus was saying and doing were what we would call non-normative today. In other words, Jesus was presenting that generation in the first century with an opportunity to do something that no other generation in the history of man has ever had the opportunity to do. And that opportunity is, has been taken off the table for the last 2,000 years for the simple reason that Jesus is not here anymore. You see that? But people, uh, because we have the red letter editions of the Bible, where we underline, you know, in my Bible version here, it's got all the words of Christ in red. 
So we think, well, that, that must be the most important. And Jesus was the Son of God. People are basically building their theology on what Jesus was saying and doing, even though what Jesus was saying and doing was what we today would believe is not, not normative because Jesus is not present. So people are no longer taking our key cues from Paul, but they want to go into the Gospels. And that's a trend that you see. And as people do that, they become open to the idea that we're in the kingdom now. So just as an example of that, here's a quote from Gibbs and Bulger, who are arguing for what's called the emergent church. And they say, how did emerging churches come to emphasize the gospel of the kingdom? Now, emergent churches, if you don't know, it's kind of um, trying to leapfrog the Protestant Reformation and go back into the medieval uh, liturgical practices of the Desert Fathers and bring those back into modern-day Christianity. So if you have children or grandchildren, uh, there's no doubt that they're being hit with emergent church doctrine. And one of the big teachings of the emergent church is that we are in the kingdom now. So these guys, emergent church writers, are basically explaining why the emergent church is so open to kingdom now theology. And the answer is they're moving the, the spotlight away from Paul back to Christ who was doing a lot of things that obviously are non-normative today because Jesus isn't present. So they say, how did emerge, and sometimes this is called red letter Christianity. Where, oh, I don't really care about the rest of the Bible. You know, I just care about Jesus kind of thing despite the fact that Jesus himself said in the upper room discourse, John 16, 12, and 13, I have many things to tell you, but you're not able to bear them. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So as, counter, as counterintuitive as it seems, Jesus never claimed to be the final uh, disclosure of truth. He clearly taught that somebody else would come along, i.e. the apostles, and complete the teaching package that he had just given sort of in infant form or seed form. You know, Jesus, how many books of the Bible did Jesus write? I don't think he wrote any books of the Bible. Now, we have four books of the Bible, the Gospels, about his life, but he never claimed to be a biblical writer, at least directly. And he very clearly was doing things that are, were one-time occurrences related to first century Israel that he's not doing today because he's not physically present. And so he opened the door in John 16, 12, and 13 to the apostles, i.e. Paul being the main guy, coming along and completing the package. But you see, that's the kind of teaching you're not getting today in the emergent church. It's not about Paul. It's all about Jesus. And I would say this, the things that Jesus said and the things that Paul said are on equal par. Not because Paul is God like Jesus was, but Jesus said the Holy Spirit himself would guide the apostles, i.e. Paul, into all truths. So you can't take one part of the Bible and make it more important than another part of the Bible. And if you're trying to figure out what's normative today, you don't build your, your house in the Gospels you build it primarily on what the Apostle Paul said. So the emergent church is going the exact opposite way on this. These guys say, how did emergent churches come to emphasize the gospel of the kingdom? It began with a shift from the epistles to the gospels as a way to understand Jesus more profoundly. Now, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that Paul is more important than Christ at all. What I'm saying is if you want to get a bearing on what's normal today, you, you don't build your house in the Gospels. You've got to factor in the things that Paul said. Paul is the guy that wrote 13 letters concerning the churches. Jesus, other than the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, you know, really didn't dictate uh, letters to churches the way Paul did. 
And so Paul, you have to take him as a priority in terms of what's normal. But the emergent church is taking the spotlight away from Paul and putting it completely in the things that Jesus said and taught in the Gospels, if that makes any sense. So one of the verses that people camp on is Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. And so Luke 17, verses 20 and 21 becomes the key verse or verses that people use to argue that we're in the kingdom now. Uh, E.R. Craven, who's a scholar that I've been quoting throughout this series, back in 1874, wrote this passage probably by the advocates of the prevalent theory of the basileia. Now, what does basileia mean? In Greek, basileia is a Greek word. What does that word mean? It means kingdom. This passage, what passage? Luke 17, 20 and 21. The kingdom is in your midst. E.R. Craven says, this passage, probably by the advocates of the prevalent theory of the basileia, the words kingdom now theology, is regarded as their most important proof text, both as to its nature and present establishment. So since I've sort of set the table and and explained how people are using this passage, what I'd like to give you are three responses to that. Uh, The first two I'll be lucky to get through before time is up tonight. And the third one, most likely, we'll have to save for for next time. But three responses to the kingdom now theologians' use of Luke 17, 20, and 21. Response number one, these verses do not say that the kingdom is within you. Most Christians, for whatever reason, think that's what Christ is saying that the kingdom was within you. You know, I've invited Jesus into my heart, people say, and so the kingdom is inside of me, the kingdom is now, and all of this kind of thing. In fact, many Bible translations, like the NIV, for example, here's a quote from the NCV. This is called the New Century Version. I mean, it it basically gives you the impression that, Jesus, that the kingdom is inside of us. How does the NCV interpret these or translate these verses? Some of the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus answered, God's kingdom is coming, but not in a way that you will be able to see it with your eyes. People will not say, look, here it is or there it is, because God's kingdom is within you. So because of these type of translations, people think that that's what these verses are saying, that the kingdom is within us. And let me sort of explain why the kingdom, these verses cannot be teaching the kingdom is inside of us. First, who was Jesus addressing, remember? The Pharisees. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees, As to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered and said, how in the world could the kingdom be inside the Pharisees? I mean, were the Pharisees believers? No. Were the Pharisees trying to murder Christ? Yes. In fact, Jesus would say of the Pharisees in John 8, verse 44, tell me if you think the kingdom is inside of these guys as I read this verse. You are of your father the devil. Does it sound like the kingdom is inside of him? Uh, You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie from his own, uh, when 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 he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. In other words, how do you know when Satan is lying, his lips are moving is the answer. For he is a liar and the father of lies. E.R. Craven says the supposition that he indicated an existing basileia or kingdom implies that it was set up in or among the Pharisees. 
So there's no way the Bible translations that say the kingdom was within you could be correct if you just pay attention to the context of the passage and who Jesus is talking to. Beyond that, why is it the kingdom of God is within us? Another reason is this. The scripture always portrays people entering the kingdom and not vice versa. The Bible never portrays the kingdom as coming into people. It's always the opposite. People, once the kingdom is established, will enter that kingdom. Uh, For example, notice, if you will, Matthew 5 and verse 20. What does Jesus say there to the Pharisees? For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So you've got to have a righteousness that's better than the Pharisees themselves to enter the kingdom. Now, obviously, that's talking about what kind of righteousness? Transferred righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Alien righteousness. Righteousness that is not our own. And unless I receive that by way of faith from Christ, I cannot enter the kingdom. So notice that it's people entering the kingdom, not the kingdom entering people. Uh, Another verse on this is Matthew 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. So you see the emphasis here? The Pharisees, because of false doctrine, were basically inhibiting people from entering the kingdom. So it's always people entering the kingdom and not the kingdom entering people. That's the basic order in the Bible. Uh, You you probably know this uh, verse here from Christ's conversation with Nicodemus. In John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, what? Enter the kingdom of God. So a person has to be born again to enter the kingdom once it's established. It doesn't say you've got to be born again so the kingdom of God can enter you. You see that? And the mistranslation of this verse reverses the order. When it says the kingdom of God is inside of you, it makes it sound like the kingdom comes into us, which is not ever what the Bible teaches. Uh... You might want to jot down Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. That's the great judgment that will take place at the end of the tribulation period called the sheep and goat judgment. It's for tribulation survivors. And the goats will be cast off the earth into Hades at that time. And the sheep will be deemed believers and they will enter the kingdom. And the whole basis of that judgment is how folks in the tribulation period treated Christ's brethren, who I think is the Jewish people, who will have been greatly persecuted during the tribulation period by the Antichrist, Satan, and the Antichrist. So you'll demonstrate people in the tribulation period itself which, by the way, won't be us, because we'll be where? Translated and raptured in heaven, watching the whole thing kind of from the balcony seats unfold. But there's going to be a lot of folks that are saved in the tribulation period, and a lot of folks that survive the tribulation period. Most of the world's population will not survive, but there is a handful that do survive. And how does Christ determine which of these survivors are believers that will enter the millennial kingdom that he just established and which ones are unbelievers that will be cast off the earth into Hades it's the whole basis of the judgment is how they treated Christ's brethren because faith without works is what is dead in other words you're not saved by works ever but in that time period you'll demonstrate your true faith 
by having a natural desire to help the Jewish people. Uh, but all of that to say, the whole tenor of that judgment is which folks are going to get, which folks are not going to enter the kingdom, and which folks are going to enter the kingdom. See that? So it's just another example where the kingdom doesn't come into people. People who are born spiritually, on the other hand, will enter the kingdom. So that would be yet another reason why these Bible translations that say the kingdom of God is within you couldn't be accurate. Another reason why the kingdom is not within us is because what is the kingdom? The kingdom is the perfect rule of Jesus Christ when he's reigning with a rod of iron. In fact, you might want to take your Bible and go over to Revelation just for a minute. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. And notice what it says here of uh, Jesus Christ. Revelation 12 and verse 5, she, that's Israel, gave birth to a son, a male child, that's Jesus, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. See that? And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now, rule all the nations with a rod of iron, that's an allusion back to Psalm 2 where God the Father is going to vest his authority in the God-man, Jesus Christ, God the Son, and he will rule all of the nations with a rod of iron. Why does there have to be a rule with the rod of iron? Because the survivors of the tribulation period entering the kingdom will do so in their mortal, non-glorified bodies. And they will have children and their children will have children, and their children will have children, and the earth will be repopulated, and what do you think just got passed down through the, the, the blood bloodline, the sin nature? So the kingdom is a very interesting time where we, as members of the church, will be in resurrected bodies, ruling alongside Christ and his delegated authority, and you, you wonder, well, who are we going to rule over? Well, we're ruling over the survivors of the tribulation period that happen to be believers and their offspring. And we, in that day, under Christ's authority, will have to rule with a rod of iron. Now, once you get to the eternal state, Revelation 21 and 22, when everybody is in a resurrected body, the rod of iron won't be necessary. See that? But during the thousand-year kingdom, the rod of iron is very necessary to subdue the rebellious impulses of the population because they'll still have a sin nature. Uh, over in Zechariah 14, 16 through 18, it talks about people that really will get tired of it and they won't want to go to Jerusalem to worship Jesus Christ. And what happens is instantaneous justice is imposed on them. They're not given any rain for their crops. And you'll find all of that in Zechariah 14, uh, 16 through 18. You see, it's, it's not like today where you get delayed justice or perverted justice. The kingdom is a time period where Satan is bound. Jesus' reign is unrestricted. And it's with a rod of iron. And consequently, there's going to be an awful lot of people in the kingdom that will behave correctly because they don't want to get punished. And that's why Satan is let loose out of his abyss at the end of the thousand years to reveal what's happening in the hearts of the descendants of those who repopulated the earth. So Satan is allowed to, and you read all about that in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. He's able to kind of stir up one final rebellion because there's a lot of people that are obeying Christ, not because they love Christ, but they just don't want to be punished. So Satan is released to reveal this reality in people. And according to Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9, the rebellion is immediately crushed. 
it's not like today where rebellion is allowed to fester and continue on for long periods of time. It's immediately crushed. Fire comes down from heaven, consumes the adversaries. Satan then is thrown into the lake of fire. So that's the kingdom. The kingdom is a time period with Jesus ruling with the rod of iron. You're not going to have carnal believers in the kingdom. Uh, if there's any carnality, it's people masking it because they don't want to be punished. So you've got, it, it's not like today where you can have a carnal Christian. So you've got ruling with a rod of iron, instantaneous justice, instantaneous punishment. And so when people try to argue that the kingdom is inside of us today, I mean, is that what happens? Um, when we step out of line, do we get immediately punished? I don't think that's true at all. Sometimes God does that in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. But I, as a New Testament Christian, have the complete and total ability to, number one, quench the Spirit. Don't I have the power to do that? I must have the power to do that because what does 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19 tell me? 1 Thessalonians, you can follow me over there. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. So that command wouldn't make any sense unless I had the ability to what? Quench the Spirit. How, how could I have the ability to quench the spirit in the kingdom when Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron in perfect justice? See that? Uh, over in Romans 6 and verse 12, it says, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Now that command wouldn't make any sense unless I had an ability as a Christian to do what? let sin reign in my mortal body. If I didn't have the ability to let sin reign in my mortal body, then the Bible wouldn't tell me to not let sin reign in my mortal body. You see that? Uh, a verse that I used on Sunday uh, that I don't have up there on the screen is Romans twelve twenty one. It says, Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Now, why would the Bible say, do not be overcome by evil unless I had the ability as a Christian to be what? Overcome by evil. Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit who is within you. Now, why would Ephesians 4 verse 30 tell me not to grieve the Holy Spirit unless I today in the church age have the ability to do what? Grieve the Holy Spirit. But let me ask you a question. When the kingdom comes and Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron, is there going to be any quenching of the Spirit through rebellion? No, it'll be immediately punished. Are there going to be people uh, letting sin reign in their mortal body? No, it'll be immediately punished. Are there going to be people grieving the Holy Spirit? No, it'll be immediately punished. So when you understand the nature of the kingdom as perfect justice, it does not fit the New Testament's description of a New Testament Christian where we still have the ability to do those things that are displeasing to God. By the way, when people hear me talk like this, they get very nervous because they think I'm promoting that. Like, yeah, let's get out there and grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm not promoting it at all. What I'm saying is it's a possibility. In the kingdom, there is no such possibility. You see that? So that's another reason why the kingdom couldn't be inside of us. If you understand the perfect justice ruling with a rod of iron nature of the kingdom. Another reason why the kingdom could not be inside of us is the way the kingdom is portrayed as we've developed it in the Old Testament. What is the kingdom? Well, it always has certain characteristics. And we've gone through all of the prophecies, all of the Old Testament passages, all of the covenants that explain this. 
you know, if you were just to go home tonight and you were to read those verses at the top of the screen, all in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, and Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25. And keep in mind, we've gone through a lot more scriptures than that. But if you're just to read those three sections, you would walk away with what the kingdom is. And you could obviously look around at the world, and you could look around at the church and say, obviously, these things aren't happening today. So what do those verses reveal about the kingdom? The kingdom is a time period when Jerusalem will be the center of world, spiritual, and political authority. Today, the city of Jerusalem is bullied by the nations of the earth. And I was reading somewhere recently that almost two-thirds of United Nations resolutions go against the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. So obviously, Israel is a factor today, but she's not ruling over the planet. She's despised by the nations. So we couldn't be in the kingdom, could we? The kingdom, according to these verses, is a time period of perfect justice, as we've talked about. World peace, where the nations will beat their swords into plowshares, obviously is not happening today. The the, the storm clouds are always on the horizon. There's there's even going to be perfect peace in the animal kingdom, where lamb and wolf, wolf and lamb, will lie down together. Have you been to the zoo lately? Wolf and lamb are in different cages, aren't they? For obvious reasons. It's the time period when a little child will be able to put their hand in a cobra's nest and not be harmed because there'll be peace in the animal kingdom. Is that what you would do with your infants? They're out there in the backyard and they find a cobra's nest and, hey, mom, dad, looky here, I'm putting my hand in. This looks like a lot of fun. Oh, go, go for it, junior, have a great time. You know, obviously you would be terrified if your children, a child did something like that. And then the kingdom is a time period when there's gonna be universal spiritual knowledge. It says the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. This planet is about, what, 80% ocean, something like that? Just as, the, just as the ocean covers this planet, the knowledge of God is going to cover the whole world during the kingdom. You say, well, is that happening today? Are you kidding me? We can't even get the Bible taught in the public schools anymore. And sad to say, most evangelical churches, many of them anyway, have kicked the Bible out of their own church instead opting for self-help or motivational speaking or psychology or whatever. And the Bible, at least in the United States, is losing ground and influence all the time. So that's what the kingdom is, you see? And when people come to a verse like Luke 17, 20, and 21, where it talks about the kingdom is, gonna, is in our hearts, supposedly, a mistranslation. They're forgetting everything that the Old Testament reveals. And let me ask you a question. Does Jesus do any explaining of what the kingdom is in Luke 17, 20, and 21? Look, look again at those verses. Uh, Luke 17, 20, and 21. It says, Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming... He answered and said to them, answered them rather, and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, nor will they say, look, here it is or there it is, for behold, the kingdom is in your midst. You see how the word kingdom there is not even defined by Christ? So obviously, and you see this over and over again with New Testament references to the kingdom. It's not, it's not redefined. So if it's not redefined, the meaning of the basileia, the meaning of the kingdom must be static. I mean, if it somehow had changed, Jesus would have given a whole bunch of explanation as to how it changed. See that? Jesus would have said, yeah, all that stuff from Isaiah, don't worry about that. Here's really what the kingdom is. It's the rule of God in our hearts. But Jesus never does that. 
And the reason he never does that is because the meaning of the kingdom is the same, no matter what passage of the Bible that you're in. So that's really another reason why I don't think these verses are saying the kingdom of God is within you. And beyond that, if the kingdom of God was set up in spiritual form, which is what everybody's arguing today in our hearts, in Luke 17, 20, and 21, then what do you do with the other teachings Jesus gave late in his ministry? Those teachings don't make any sense. So, for example, notice Matthew 19, verse 28. This is very late in Christ's ministry. And he starts talking about an earthly kingdom yet to come because the nation of Israel had rejected the offer. What does he say there in Matthew 19, 28? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. Now what throne do you think that is that he's seated on one day? David's throne. Going back to the Davidic covenant, where do I find that in the Bible? 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. We covered that Davidic covenant very early on in our teaching. The Son of Man will sit on his, on his glorious throne, and you all shall, shall sit upon twelve thrones, speaking of the apostles, judging the what? Twelve tribes of Israel. Now when you study Ezekiel 47, what you'll learn is in the kingdom, in the land of Israel, the nation of Israel is going to be divided according to different tribal allotments. Each tribe will govern a, a, a specific literal geographical section. And what Jesus is saying here is during that time period, Jesus will be on David's throne, not up in heaven somewhere, not in the human heart, but in which city? Jerusalem, and under him will be the 12 apostles. And underneath each of the 12 apostles, you throw in Ezekiel 47 into the mix, will be a tribe governing a specific plot of real estate. Now, this passage makes zero sense. If we're going to say, well, Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus set up a spiritual kingdom. If Jesus set up a spiritual kingdom in our hearts and changed the definition of the kingdom, then what in the world is he talking about here? To me, it doesn't look like he changed anything. Christ's teaching on the kingdom is consistent with what has been developed in the Old Testament. Uh, take a look at one chapter to the right, Matthew uh, 20, verses 20 and 21. The mother of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, also called the sons of what? The sons of thunder. And she's one proud mama, isn't she? I mean, she's proud of her boys. She's looking out for her boys. A good mother does that. It says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him, and said to her, he said to her, rather, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit on your right and on your left. Wow. Wow. And you'll notice that Jesus never tells her, oh, you silly woman, don't you know that there's not going to be a future kingdom on the earth? Don't you know I'm reigning in your heart right now? He never says that. In fact, it's interesting that if he taught that back in Luke 17, she must have been taking a nap because she missed the whole teaching. Because she's still believing in a future earthly kingdom and Jesus never corrects her. The only thing he corrects her on is the authority is given to those who bear the cross in this life. The cross comes before the crown. That's what he corrects her on. He never corrects her on the reality of a future kingdom. But again, what Christ is saying here makes zero sense. 
If, Jesus, if the kingdom has now been repackaged, Luke 17, and Jesus is now reigning in our hearts, uh, go over to Matthew 26, 29. And I've had amillennialists, kingdom now theologians on Twitter, try to tell me this in arguments. They'll say, Jesus never mentioned an earthly kingdom. And my response is, I don't know if we're reading the same New Testament. I'm seeing Jesus mention an earthly kingdom in Matthew 19, 28. Matthew 20, verses 20 and 21. Uh, he mentions a future kingdom in Matthew 26. Look at verse uh, 29, if we could. He says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink of it with you in my Father's kingdom. So he never canceled a future earthly kingdom on earth with literal eating and drinking from the fruit of the vine, which is a very physical experience. Uh... How about the thief on the cross? Did the thief on the cross believe in a coming kingdom? Remember the thief on the cross that trusted in Christ and at the last minute in what might be called a deathbed conversion? Remember what he said? The penitent thief, remember Jesus was crucified between the two thieves. One thief mocked him to his grave and presumably went to hell. The other thief trusted in Christ and his salvation at the last minute and presumably went to paradise. Not presumably, he did go to paradise because Jesus said, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. But look at what that penitent thief said, Luke 23, verse 40, let's see what, verse 42. It says, and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, the penitent thief on the cross understood there was going to be a future kingdom. Jesus didn't stop and say, well, let me cancel that. Uh, there really is no future earthly kingdom because I'm reigning right now in the hearts of my people. I mean, everybody that hung around Jesus and was influenced directly by his teaching. None of them had this amillennial idea that the kingdom is now. Uh, take a look, if you could, at Acts. Well, look at Mark 15 for a minute. Mark 15, verse 43. You remember Joseph of Arimathea? The rich disciple in whose tomb Christ was buried? You say, well, how come Jesus had to be buried in the tomb of a rich man? 700 years ago in Isaiah 53, Isaiah said that would happen. That's why. Prophecies in the Bible come to pass, literally. Short term and long term. But Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple, it says this. So he was obviously close to Christ. He was a secret disciple. He was around the teachings of Christ. It says Joseph of Arimathea... Came a, uh, came a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for what? The kingdom of God. See, the error of their thinking is they thought it was coming right now. They just didn't understand the postponement completely. But they were still looking for a kingdom they never had in their minds this idea that Christ canceled everything the Old Testament says about the kingdom or changed the definition because he's ruling and reigning in our hearts today. See, that's what I'm trying to point out. If Jesus set up a spiritual form of the kingdom in the hearts of people in Luke 17, then everybody that was close to Christ didn't get the message. They didn't get the memo. They were taking a nap when Christ taught that spiritual lesson of course, I'm being facetious because Christ never taught that lesson. The only people that are teaching that lesson are the amillennialists and the replacement theologians who want you to believe that the church is the kingdom. You know, if you were to stand up in front of all of these people that were hanging around Christ in the first century, all of his disciples, and you were to tell them that there is no future kingdom, 
because the kingdom is being fulfilled now in spiritual form, I think they would all just start laughing out loud. I mean, the, the whole idea would be so foreign to, to their total understanding. Uh, one more for good measure. Take a look at Acts 1, if you could. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. What does it say there? This is his, uh, just prior to his ascension. Remember, there's 40 days in between his resurrection and ascension. The resurrection has happened. The ascension is yet to come, 40 days down the road. So he's giving them teaching during this 40-day interval. It says, so when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord... Is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to who? To Israel. The disciples still believe there would be a kingdom on the earth through the nation of Israel. What they didn't understand is the timing of it. They didn't understand there's going to be a long delay or an age. But they never got the idea that the kingdom was canceled. And what does Jesus say there in verse 7? He said to them, it is not for you to know the what? The times or the epochs which the Father is fixed by his own authority. You see, Christ never told them, forget the kingdom. Forget Israel. Israel is going to be replaced by the church. Jesus is reigning, I'm reigning now in your hearts. He never gave them any such teaching. They never understood him to be teaching any such doctrine. The only thing they didn't understand is the timing. That's what baffled them. They thought it was going to come instantaneously. They didn't understand this long period of time called the church age when the kingdom would be in postponement. And that's why Jesus taught the parable of the minas in Luke 19 where he begins to talk about a long age of time when God's people are given certain things to invest on his behalf while he's gone. That was a new teaching to them. Why was it a new teaching to them? Because according to Luke 19, verse 11, which immediately precedes the parable of the Minas and explains why he taught the parable of the Minas, it says, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. Why? Because he was near Jerusalem, the prophesied headquarters of the kingdom, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he says, it's, the kingdom is going to come, but it's in a state not of cancellation, but postponement. So the only issue they had wrong was not the future earthly kingdom. They knew that it was going to come. They just didn't understand the timing. That was their misunderstanding. And the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, misunderstood not the reality of a future kingdom, but they didn't understand that the positions of authority in the kingdom are given to those who bear the cross in this life because the cross comes before the crown. And you'll notice that in all these stories when Christ is correcting them, he's never correcting them on their definition of the kingdom, on their understanding of the reality of a coming kingdom. He's just correcting them on timing and on who, who's going to have authority. See that? See, and what I, my point is very simple. All, all of those statements that Christ has made to these folks that we just went through don't make any sense if Jesus is reigning in our hearts because he set up the kingdom in Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. So having said all that, what's the conclusion of the matter here? The NIV and the NCV have it has it completely and totally wrong when it says the kingdom of God is inside of us or the kingdom of God is within you. Completely wrong. 
uh, translation of the scripture. That's why you have to be very careful about what Bible version you're using. The NIV, some of you might be NIV positive. What is the NIV? The NIV is a paraphrase. See that? What's a paraphrase? It's sort of a general summary of the teachings of the Bible. Am I against all uses of the NIV? Not necessarily, because sometimes you want to read the Bible and get kind of a devotional understanding. You've you got to get through the work week. You're on lunch break and you need that kind of liver quiver to get you through an unhappy day with a mean boss, you know, those kind of things. I mean, I get all that. I mean, I used to read The Way and, and different translations of the Bible because I was reading it from a devotional level. And that's, there's a place for that. What I'm saying is to do the type of detailed studies that we're doing here, you know, trying to figure out what does the Bible say about the kingdom, you don't use the NIV for that. You've got to use the NASB or the NKJV. Those are my two favorites because those are English translations that claim to be word for word. They're not just paraphrasing things. They're doing careful word for word study. So the deeper you go in your study of God's word, like what we're doing here, trying to flesh out the doctrine of the kingdom, I would not use the NIV for that. You use different Bible translations for different purposes. So I think the NIV and the NCV is completely wrong. I think the NASB has it right when it says, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words... That generation had an opportunity to do something that no other generation in the history of mankind up until this point in time and even after this point in time has had the opportunity to do. They had the ability to take Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, and enthrone him over the nation on his terms. Not their own terms, but on his terms. That was their opportunity. And had they done that, the kingdom, as is predicted in Isaiah and everywhere else in the Old Testament, in a nanosecond, would have covered the whole earth. And the story of the Gospels is how that generation turned down that opportunity. And that is the significance of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Because that sermon reveals not just the politics and the economics, which is what everybody was interested in. It reveals the moral quality of the kingdom. So they wanted the politics, but they didn't want the morals and the righteousness. So they turned it down. And consequently, this opportunity has been completely taken off the table because Jesus Christ the King is gone. He's in heaven. And that opportunity will not be re-extended to any generation until after the rapture of the church when that same opportunity will be given to the nation of Israel yet future in the tribulation. See that? And as we know from our studies, the nation of Israel always gets it right, not the first time, but the second time. We've gone through that. And the next time it happens, they're going to get it right. It's going to take the events of the tribulation to do it. And then the kingdom of God will come. So I'll try to unpack that next week sort of as a way to understand, better understand Luke 17, verses 20 and 21.